we shall go on to our um, next speaker, uh, Dr. George Putran, who is the Chief of Glaucoma Services, and again, an amazing surgeon from Marvin the Kai Care Systems based at Madurai. Madurai. And I'm sure we can look forward to a lot of learning on his talk on failed uh, glaucoma drainage devices. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Chitra, ma'am. I hope my uh, screen is visible. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, in, uh, in refractory glaucoma following a glaucoma drainage device, if there is an obvious cause, it's easy to treat the cause, like a tube blockage, a tube retraction, or a T non cyst and bleb encapsulation. But in, in uh, some of the cases, there is no apparent cause, and then it becomes much more difficult. So, coming to the obvious causes, like uh, iris or vitreous blocking the tube. It is highly rewarding if you could surgically remove this material, blocking the tube for better IOP control. Again, for tube uh, retractions, uh, it is, uh, as Dr. Shandar has already mentioned, using uh, surgeons occasionally need to lengthen tubes which have retracted. Also, if there's sufficient length of tube available, you could even recite it as was done in this patient to a different site in the anterior chamber. Or sometimes you might, it might or sometimes be easier to just put in a second tube. For example, this is a retracted tube uh, and then an infronasal uh, repeat tube. Here, another uh, uh, suprotemporal retracted tube and uh, supranasal repeat tube. Uh, this is a significant late complication seen mostly with valve devices, the Ahmed glaucoma valve, where there is progressive thickening of the pleb capsule and increased intraocular pressure. This particular patient had uh, we excised the capsule beneath the conjunctiva, part of the uh, capsule beneath the conjunctiva three times until it totally scarred down. And finally, we had to place a second tube in the infronasal quadrant. And this was, in fact, published as a BMJ case report. Now, coming to this is the most difficult part. You have a tube which works for about this particular patient till eight years post op. You know, this was a patient who had a, a lensectomy, vitrectomy for a, a micros for microspherophakia and then refractory glaucoma, first tube in the suprotemporal quadrant. Nothing wrong here. And if you look at this is the uh, this is the RD which was placed in the suprotemporal aspect, and it looks like a, a relatively good diffuse bleb, but with uh, IOPs uh, refractory to maximal medicines. So we plan. This is just a few surgical tips on how to plan a repeat tube. So the important aspect is to have, have a very good exposure. Uh, seven zero silk is what we use, and usually for a supranasal quadrant, if you could place your traction a little towards the temporal side of the cornea and and clamp it towards the temporal side. Uh, temporal side, you can get very good exposure of the supranasal conjunctiva. Uh, exposure is the key. And uh, I think uh, mentally also you should be prepared and you should just assume that you're sitting uh, supratemporal and you're doing your, just forget that the second tube is there, supratemporal, you're doing your first tube. And uh, uh, the, so that is the medial and the lateral rectus. And then the supramid uh, uh, suture goes in goes into the tube lumen and uh, the first tie of the, this is the 6 0 vicryl we use, the first tie is over the uh, supramid suture, complete watertight closure. Actually, you position yourself slightly uh, supranasal aspect when you, unlike in, uh, when you're doing a supratemporal uh, tube, you sit a little to the temporal aspect here, you sit a little nasal, so the first uh, wing of the RD goes beneath the superior rectus muscle. And then the, uh, the other wing goes uh, beneath the medial rectus. Uh. So everything, everything is the same as uh, your supratemporal placement, except that you're working in the supranasal quadrant. So the, uh, the RD plate is positioned beneath adjacent rectus muscles. And uh, it is fixed to, the, fixed to the sclera about nine millimeters uh, posterior to the limbus with uh, 9-0 nylon uh, sutures. And then the second uh, 6-0 vicryl uh, tie that is uh, ahead of the uh, supramid. And then our trademark uh, trademark uh, 23 gauge uh, needle generated scleral tract to, uh, to introduce the tube into the anterior chamber. Uh, we have seen that the 23 gauge, the, the needle track created with through the 23 gauge needle is a uh, very snug fit for uh, 
all the tubes of uh, glaucoma drainage implants uh, from the different manufacturers and there is a snug fit without any peritubular leakage. It's extremely important to make sure that the anterior chamber doesn't uh, collapse when you withdraw the needle and then a two millimeter uh, was marked, two millimeter tube was draped over the cornea, two millimeter mark, uh, it is uh, trimmed and then the tube was threaded uh, into the anterior chamber through this uh, four millimeter scleral track. We feel that burying the uh, tube in the patient's own sclera is a lot of protection against uh, the dreaded tube exposures, extrusions and extrusions and uh, related uh, tube related infections. So that is the second tube in the supranasal quadrant. So this is the post-op picture with tube with the second tube. And uh, coming to some considerations about, uh, so management of refractory glaucoma post-GDD would involve a repeat tube, which is probably the cornerstone of treatment and also cyclophotocalculation, which could be a diode, micro, micropulse or an endoscopy. There are some major considerations when you plan a repeat tube, whether you are going to choose an armored glaucoma valve or the non-valve uh, implant and the quadrant of implantation. So this is something which is very important. The anteroposterior diameter of the armored glaucoma valve is more than the uh, non-valved RD. And it is, uh, it is critical that uh, there is a two millimeter safe zone uh, where the uh, posterior, posterior part of the episcleral plate doesn't impinge on. And so the AGDs might be safest in the suprotemporal and infrotemporal quadrants. Also, uh, this, there is a, a bleb that forms infrotemporally could distort the distort the lower eye, lower eyelid. There is a lot of cosmosis involved. The scleral patch that may be kept there uh, might be maximally exposed in the supratemporal quadrant. Again, uh, we used to place a lot of infronasal implants till about four years back, back until we started analyzing our results with the infronasal implants in both adult and pediatric glaucomas. And to a surprise, we found that though the infrotemporal, infronasal implants were, were working as well as the supratemporal implants in the adult group, in the pediatric group, placement of the RD in the supratemporal quadrant had better IOP related outcomes and is a safer surgical option. The number of tube exposures were more in the infronasal quadrant in the pediatric age group. And uh, so now our preferred uh, go-to quadrant for a repeat tube is a supranasal quadrant and repeat tube has a definite place in the management of uh, select situate in the management of select refractory glaucomas where the primary tube has failed and the uh, patient does not respond to maximal medical therapy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Joy. That was a very challenging case, which is sure. So uh, again, a very basic question. How do you assess a failing uh, tube? You go by the bleb height or the rise IOP or the extent of glaucoma damage? I think it's uh, unlike in, uh, in blebs, in uh, trabeculectomy blebs, we don't get much of a clue about... Uh, uh, about uh, bleb failure in uh, about the blebs over the epistleral plate of uh, glaucoma drainage devices. Sometimes it's very obvious. It's very obvious, like what we saw in the in the picture, where there is a highly localized ten C or T non cyst there. But in most of the non-valved implants, it is it is nicely low and diffuse, but still with refractory IOP. I think I think the only way to go go ahead with the treatment is to look at the intraocular pressures. Intraocular pressures keep rising with the maximal medical therapy. Probably there is some amount of blood thickening that is happening. You could even do a B-scan to see the aqueous reservoir between the plate and the uh, fibrous capsule that forms around the epistleral plate. Again, you can also look at uh, progressive, uh, progressive glaucomatous optic nerve head and visual field loss also. Yeah. Thank you very much. Only I'm going to go on to the next speaker. I'm sure we need to have asked many more questions. But we have to do justice to all our speakers. And thanks a lot.